Uh, welcome back. Um, I have to correct the slide. Um, Dr. Paul Heunigen Hune is Professor Emeritus of Theoretical Philosophy. <laughs> and uh, we thank him very much for coming all the way from Germany and to chair this session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, celebrate Jad, uh, his birthday and his life work. Uh, so uh, this is probably the most exotic session of this conference, you know, about uh, philosophy. Um, we heard yesterday that um, a quote from Jad where he said uh, that a new philosophy of science is desirable, which means uh, he's not really satisfied with the old philosophy of science. And I, I can say that in our conversations, I never heard him saying something like, you know, it's so glad, I'm so glad that philosophy of science exists because um, we then get more clarity about what history of science is and because you get down to the bottom and we, you know, you do our practice, our training. Never heard anything like that. I guess for the future, that's about as probable as when you ask someone here, um, what's your relationship with Jad? And then this person will say, you know, Jed is a very nice, um, almost British gentleman. Whenever we talk about my work or the work of others, he always praises it, and I never know whether he really means it. Um, uh, also, um, when we talked about uh, Kuhn, for instance, uh, I never heard him saying, you know, I'm so glad that Kuhn turned from a historian to a philosopher, or would-be philosopher of science, because, you know, if you want to get to the essence of what science is, we do need philosophy, right? We historians can't do that. Never, never heard that either. Uh, so um, what I saw then, uh, a, a positive statement about philosophy was in the first um, issue of um, uh, Archimedes, which was also the beginning of our uh, stronger interactions, in which he said that Archimedes has three fundamental goals, uh, one, two, and finally, where possible and desirable to bring the histories of science and technology into closer contact with philosophy of science. Now that's interesting if you read that carefully, when possible and desirable. So there are situations in which it's not possible, would be desirable. There are also possible situations where it's possible but not really desirable because you can't use that in any sense. So when possible and desirable then we should um, uh, move into closer contact. Well, as a matter of fact, as I'm on the editorial board, as one of two philosophers, I think, uh, I can tell you within the last, what is it, 25 years, I've never been consulted about anything concerning philosophy of science, or that that would have been my job. Anyway, I don't know where that comes from. Perhaps it, it was a, uh, I was the wrong uh, a person for that job, at any rate. So uh, we'll have today then this um, uh, contact to philosophy. Funnily enough, I asked uh, two of the three panelists today whether they feel as philosophers, and two of them denied firmly. I didn't ask uh, Don Howard because I know that he says, yes, I am a philosopher. So the first speaker today is, um, do I have to move uh, there? No, that doesn't do the job. Do I move there? Here we are. So, uh, you see our panelists, and we start to the, with the one who is professor of philosophy, Don Howard, well known in also the circles of historians. Uh, Don, please have the floor. So let me begin by uh, thanking Diana for the uh, inspiration for having this meeting, for the invitation to uh, join in the meeting. It's been really glorious so far. Uh, Cindy for all of her extraordinary help in uh, logistics and organization, uh, and Jed for being, as Diana has been for a long time, a, a, a very good and supportive uh, friend. And so it's uh, special for me to be here. It's a curious fact that, try as I might, I cannot remember when I first met Jed. I literally can't remember when I first met Jed. It's as if there's always been a Jed, right? And I suspect there always will be a Jed. 
So it's possible that he and I met for the first time, I don't know if you have a memory on this, when we were both graduate students in the Boston area in the early 1970s, uh, Jed was studying history of physics with Erwin Hebert at Harvard, and I was studying philosophy of physics with Abner Shimoni at Boston University. And the legends notwithstanding, the Charles River is not an impenetrable barrier. Uh, there was a lot of traffic uh, both ways. I have lots of warm memories of conferences, colloquia talks on the Harvard campus and BU we ran and still to this day do this uh, wonderful uh, series on the uh, lecture series on the philosophy of science that was a gathering place for everyone in that uh, broader, uh, broader community. So it could have been there. Uh, it could have been at an HSS meeting sometime in the later 70s or the 80s. I have a dim memory of there being at least one event connected with the Einstein Papers project when I was working there for a couple of years in the mid 80s of one event uh, where Jed was present. I, my memory might be faulty. Uh, could it have been the launch party for volume one of the Einstein Papers? Uh, we'll have to check our collective memories. <laughs> well, I've repressed that whole memory, so anyway. Maybe it's because of the glasses part of it, but uh, anyway. But I do have very clear memories starting in the early 90s, after Jed made his move to the Dibner of many visits uh, uh, in his office over there. Uh, uh, one theme that ran through all of these visits was uh, he was always eager to show me his newest toy. And you know, by the way, that's what he spent all of his MacArthur Fellowship money on, was toys of one kind or another. I was recalling one of these in particular last night when Zach was speaking. Uh, uh, Jed showed me with great enthusiasm, and this must have been around 95, I think, when Nanny Ware was in its infancy, he had found this program that he had installed on his desktop at the Dibner, and I don't know whether surreptitiously or not, on Zach's computer at home, and it made it possible for Jed to watch in real time everything that poor Zach was doing on his computer, and, uh, and Jed was really proud of, uh, uh, of that. It's still on the computer. <laughs> Good for you, right, you're, you're a good parent, yes. Um, but interactions with Jed that are of more relevance to the themes we're talking about uh, here uh, began in the mid-90s. Uh, and a number of these interactions, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, have at the center some institution building having to do with bringing the historians and the philosophers and the physicists together in productive, collaborative work. So it was in uh, the fall of 1995 that uh, Jed and I, as founding members of the advisory board of a still uh, running series called the Seven Pines Symposium, uh, met in a small uh, country lodge in Wisconsin. Uh, this is under the auspices of the University of Minnesota History of Science program. Uh, Alan was there as one of the founding members of the advisory board. Uh, Erwin Hebert was there as one of the founding members of the advisory board. What we invented on that occasion was this spectacular, and as I say, still ongoing series of events where every year we would pick a topic close to the cutting edge of advancing physics. And then we would gather something on the order of 25 people, most of them physicists. Sometimes with reluctance, we would invite a biologist or a mathematician, but mostly physicists. And then a smattering of historians and philosophers of physics. And we would uh, lock them in a country lodge for four days where they had to talk with one another. We gave explicit instructions to the speakers that you are not to give technical talks, you are not to give a talk on your latest research results. Instead, you're going, you're going to give a talk that's a kind of a pedagogical introduction for the whole group about the problem space that we're thinking in. And then those talks were very, very short, and we'd set aside like typically two hours after each session that was for nothing but conversation. 
Uh, these became, and still to this day, are incredibly rich intellectual feasts. There are a number of people here in the audience who have been at these, uh, uh, at these meetings. I see heads nodding uh, here. Uh, if Jürgen's around today, we've had Jürgen to several of those, uh, uh, those meetings. Uh, everyone who has, part Alan has been to several of those meetings, that's right. Uh, everyone who has participated in the Seven Pines Symposia uh, come away with a lot of warm, fuzzy feelings about these. It's a very different kind of intellectual, uh, intellectual space where you have a kind of collaboration that our normal professional lives simply don't allow us uh, to have. Those meetings have, had, have developed such cachet, and Phil Stamp, who's now on the advisory board and has been for a long time, uh, can validate this story. Those meetings have developed such cachet that on a couple of occasions, uh, we have deliberately decided not to invite some really famous people, because we want to make sure that the people in the room play nicely with one another, uh, where those people caught wind of the meeting and then wrote us furiously angry messages saying, why haven't you allowed me to come to this uh, meeting? Phil knows exactly whom I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but that's one of the places where Jed and I came together to do some institution building to try to promote the very interaction among historians, philosophers, and physicists that uh, is one of the themes of the meeting uh, today. Another, uh, uh, I remember very clearly, this got started in uh, the fall of 2002 at the joint uh, HSS-PSA uh, meeting in um, uh, Milwaukee. This was right at that time when the science wars were uh, at their fever pitch. Uh, there was a lot of unhappiness among uh, many of us who are, in fact, in this room today about the direction in which uh, history of science was headed and philosophy of science. And we came together at a memorable breakfast meeting to ask ourselves, can we create uh, yet another new institutional structure that would bring the historians and the philosophers together to do the kind of history and philosophy of science that we thought needed more presence or the, uh, of a kind that needed to be better supported as these disciplines were going forward. That meeting bore fruit a few years later in the creation of what's now called the Ampersand HPS uh, series, uh, 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 our cute uh, uh, icon for integrated history and philosophy of science, uh, uh, which has now held a total of seven uh, really wonderful international conferences, has become a major presence uh, in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, the profession, uh, yet another space in which this kind of scholarship can be, uh, can be nurtured and, uh, and celebrated. Uh, I remember uh, the fourth of the uh, integrated HPS meetings, which was convened in Athens in 2012 uh, with uh, Theo, uh, Theo playing a leading role in organizing uh, that meeting. Uh, uh, Jed and I, by coincidence, had both decided to arrive a day early so as to be tourists, and we spent just a, a glorious day uh, hiking up to the Parthenon, uh, then walking back down, exploring the Agora, then sitting down for coffee late in the afternoon, uh, where Jed was eager yet again to show me his newest toy, this really spectacular camera he had just bought, and he explained to me the scam that he had been running for years, where he would go out and he would buy the priciest, best, brand new digital SLR on the market, he would use it for a year, then he would sell it on the used market, recoup a major fraction of the expense, plow, that back, you know, plow it back into buying yet, uh, the, you know, next year's newest, uh, newest uh, uh, toy. Uh, but again, wonderfully uh, warm uh, memories of these occasions uh, together with Jed. And I would like to think that we managed to do some good through uh, all of this uh, work. But let me also say a few words just about the topic, uh, which is uh, philosophy when desirable, figuring out how to get philosophy and history of science generally, philosophy and history of physics more specifically, uh, in fruitful uh, interaction uh, with one another. 
uh, given my own personal investment in the institution building I've just uh, reviewed, which included also, by the way, even earlier in 1990, helping to launch the uh, organization called HOPOS, the International History of Philosophy of Science uh, Society. Um, uh, I have spent a lot of time thinking about the relationship between history uh, and, uh, and, and philosophy. Uh, for many years after we launched the Integrated HPS uh, initiative, people would come up to me and they would say, well, what exactly is Integrated HPS? And for the longest time, I would scratch my head and I would, I would answer it by uh, ostention. I would, I would figuratively point and I'd say, well, it's what John Norton does, right? But that wasn't really a satisfactory answer. And so I've spent more time in the past few years uh, trying to come up with a better answer to that question, or at least to the question, what might integrated history and philosophy of science look like? And it might surprise you that where those reflections have taken me uh, is back to Ernst Mach. Gave a paper a couple of years ago uh, at the uh, uh, conference in Vienna on the centenary of Mach's uh, death, uh, a paper the title of which uh, sort of oddly echoes the title of this whole event. The title of the paper was Back to the Future, uh, where that title was meant to suggest that one perhaps surprising place that we could go to think about what a future integrated history and philosophy of science might look like was all the way back to Mach at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. I imagine that there are some people in the room who are sitting there saying, are you kidding me? Mach, the poster child for you know, reductionist phenomenalism, the crudest kind of logical positivism, he's the figure we look to to help us think about integrated history and philosophy of science? Well, I'm really quite serious about this. Well, why? Well, start here, let's do a little hopos, a little history of the philosophy of science. And since time is short, I will just uh, be declamatory, right? I won't give you tons of evidence here. But one of the things that I've learned the hard way is that the mock that we were all introduced to when we were young students in the field, uh, the mock who was interpreted to us mainly by uh, right-wing logical empiricists in the 1920s and 1930s, and then their intellectual descendants among neo-positivists of the post-war period, that mock, who was represented to me as just a crude version of Rudolf Carnap, you know, that Mach had the reductionist phenomenalism, but it was logically inept, and Carnap came along and applied more powerful tools and wrote the Aufbau and went Mach one, one better. That is not the historical uh, Ernst Mach. That's not at all the historical uh, Ernst Mach. If you read the various reflections that Mach penned on his own program, he never leads with reductionist phenomenalism. No, he uses very different expressions to talk about the nature of his project in the history and the philosophy of science. One expression that he uses is the biologico-economical approach. And that's a hint to the insight that Mach is better understood as a kind of uh, 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 epistemological naturalist, and I'm quite serious about this, where he's using biology and psychology as the framing sciences for a kind of integrated history uh, and philosophy of, uh, uh, of science. Uh, I will cite one reference because I think it's a spectacular book that should be much better known where this is a central theme. And that's the book called Ernst Mach's World Elements by the recently deceased, tragically deceased Eric Banks. Wonderful book, makes this case at, uh, at great length. Another phrase that Mach used repeatedly to talk about his own program, and this is even closer to the point that I wanted to emphasize here today, is he referred to his method as the historical critical method. The subtitles of both of his major historical works, his big book on the history of mechanics and his later big book on the history of the theory of heat, the two subtitles each use some variation on the expression historisch kritisch dargestellt, represented in an historical critical manner. 
Well, what did he mean by that? Well, one thing to bear in mind is that that expression, historical critical, had a resonance in late 19th century uh, German uh, culture that it doesn't have for us uh, today. And that is, uh, it is a gesture toward the tradition of critical biblical hermeneutics, where exactly that turn of phrase, the historical critical method, was the standard description of what was novel in critical biblical hermeneutics. What might that have to do with the way Mach was a historian and a philosopher of science? Well, very quickly, what the key idea in critical biblical hermeneutics is, is that you historicize texts like the Bible in part for the purpose of, uh, through putting them in context, problematizing the claims that they make to being the revealed word of God. And in a sense, when you read those historical works of Mach, he's doing the same sort of thing. He's trying to situate the achievements of Newton and others in a historical context for the purpose of showing that while the theories that were developed were perfectly reasonable responses to the problematic challenges of the day, now in a very different kind of problematic situation, they perhaps don't appear such and their authority as received wisdom is therefore rendered a little bit less than what it might, uh, what it might otherwise uh, have been. Did anybody spot this as a part of Mach's uh, project back in the day? Well, huh? Yeah. one person who very definitely spotted it was my guy Einstein, who in his 1916 obituary for uh, Mach specifically highlighted the historical critical approach and not the reductionist phenomenalism. And he has high praise for the way in which that lesson about the sort of historical decentering of the, 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 the received physics helped him to be the kind of radical innovator in physics that of course uh, he, he was. There's still a project here though. Uh, this is just a starting point. Uh, let me just conclude these brief remarks by saying that I think a, a, a productive project uh, for the near term would be to get a lot of us together to do a lot of hard thinking about what that notion of an historical critical approach to both the history of science and the philosophy of science could mean for uh, the 21st century. What is the specific contribution of the historian working in this critical mode to the concerns of the philosopher and then pointing the arrow in the other direction. What are the specific contributions that the philosopher can make to the critical uh, historical project? I've got ideas about this. I'm working them out as I try to finish the paper I alluded to a while ago. Uh, but again, let me just end by saying that I think that this would be a very fruitful thing for the community uh, to take up uh, at this point uh, in its history. So thank you very, very much.